we'll uh, get started on the epistles of John. Now, you know, this class onwards. Uh, so uh, we'll begin with an introduction uh, to the first epistle of John mm, a little more specifically. And also, maybe we can just touch a little bit upon the other two uh, epistles as well. So uh, this is just a brief introduction. Uh, but next class onwards, we will be looking at uh, the first epistle of John verse by verse. Today is just the introduction. So uh, we look at the authorship. Uh, we look at why the book, uh, why these epistles, why these letters were written, uh, the purpose for it, and uh, maybe very briefly the message which they contain. So coming to authorship, uh, it was quite a controversial issue earlier. Uh, in the very beginning, you know, in the early church, um, after the times of the early church, uh, during the early phase when you had uh, um, many of these ancient church writers, uh, at that time there was a lot of controversy because people were not very sure whether or not they should consider um, Apostle John as the writer of these letters. Because when, if you were to look in your first John chapter one, you will see that there it doesn't. Uh, there's no introduction of any kind. He just starts off the letter without even giving one line of introduction. Uh, he doesn't uh, explain who is writing. He doesn't explain to whom he is writing. Uh, without any kind of address uh, addressing to of the people, he just quickly starts off with the subject matter, and it's only in the book of Hebrews. And in the first epistle of John that we see this, where not even one word of explanation is given as to who is writing and you know why they are writing. Uh, so, uh, however, in second John and third John, at least he introduces himself as the elder. Okay, uh, so uh, in none of these three places does it very clearly say, you know, I am the disciple of Jesus who is writing this. A particular letter. So, uh, why do we say that these three epistles, um, that these three letters belong to John? Why do we see that John is the writer of these? Um, one main reason that people place uh, put forward is that uh, Polycarp of Smyrna, he was considered a disciple of uh, uh, of John. So. He writes a letter to the Philippians, and when he does that, he makes quotations. You know, in in his letter to the Philippians, he includes quotations from the first epistle of John, First uh, John four two to three, and he also mentions First John two twenty four in his letter. And uh, uh, because he was considered a disciple of John, uh, they say that he must have quoted from whatever he has learned from. Uh, you know his his uh, master's um, e epistles. However, Irenaeus of Lyons is the first one who specifically says that these letters, First John and Second John, were clearly written by John. Okay, so he very clearly says that they were written by John. So based on Polycarp's quotations and based on what Irenaeus openly says about the authorship, we today accept that. Uh, John was probably the author. Uh, there's another person, Eusebius, who also was one of these ancient, uh, you know, Christian writers, and uh, he says that many people consider the Second John and Third John as anti legomena They had two lists uh, of, you know, at that time uh, the New Testament had not yet been fully uh, put together. And uh, they were still considering which uh, letters should be considered as canonical and uh, which should be, you know, just left as letters. And uh, so at that time, they had formed a list of uh, two types of letters. The legomena were the letters which uh, are regarded as being, you know, inspired. They are they regarded as letters which were written directly by the apostles uh, or at least someone who was, you know, in close association with the apostles. On the other hand, the anti logomana was a uh, list would include letters where they are not very sure whether those people were directly people who had known Jesus and associated with him, or at least had associated with the disciples. So um, Eusebius says that the second John and third John had been placed in the anti legomena list 
uh, in the beginning. But he says that he personally is convinced that uh, John himself has return, written it. So there's, there's, there's this little bit of controversy that was going on in the early times uh, regarding who the writer of these uh, letters is. However, uh, they point out that when it comes to the subject matter, which is talked about in these letters and the kind of grammar and syntax and all which is used, they say there's a great similarity between the Gospel of John and these epistles, which seems to indicate that they are that they're all being authored by the same person. One main thing that we see about um, uh, the Gospel of John is that um, John always uses contrasts. He talks about light and darkness. He talks about the children of God and the and the children of the uh, of the of the devil. You know, he talks about truth and he talks about falsehood. So uh, uh, John always makes contrasts, and we see the, we see this very same thing even in the first epistle of John. We see many sets of contrasts being given, and uh, so. They say that based on the similarity of the subject matter, uh, based on the kind of uh, wordings that are used, uh, they all uh, these epistles and the gospel were all written by the same person. Um, we also see that uh, some of the very specific words and phrases which are used in um, the gospel of John, those very specific words and phrases are also found in the epistles. Uh, for example, maybe we can just look at one example. And if I uh, you know someone could actually read out uh, a couple of verses for us, please. Um, if someone could read out for us, First John chapter three, verse eight, and then we will see how this particular verse, uh, you know, resonates with something that is mentioned in the Gospel of John. Uh, First John chapter three, verse eight. If someone could read out, please. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Yeah, and uh, this we have almost similar wording even in the Gospel of John. Uh, so if you could read out John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8.44, please. John 8.44. You are of your father, the devil, and your, and your will do what your father desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he's a liar and the father of life. So we see both in First John three eight and in John eight forty four, um, very similar things are said. Uh, in First John three eight, it says the one who does what is sinful is of the devil, and uh, in John eight forty four, the same thing is again repeated. You belong to your father, the devil, and uh, in First uh, John. 3 8 it says the devil has been sinning from the beginning and here in john 8 44 it again says something similar he was a murderer from the beginning uh, and i've just used one example uh, you would have something like 20 30 um, you know uh, uh, verses passages where you have uh, similarities so uh, if you were to go to one of these commentaries you'll have an entire list where they look at the uh, phrases used in the Gospel of John and the phrases used over here in uh, the Epistles of John. And they point out the great similarity in subject matter, uh, great similarity in the phrases and wordings that are used. So based on this, based on the pattern, based on the style, um, the writing style in, in, in these particular epistles, they say that they were all written by the same author. Now, you know, those of us who are just um, students of the Bible, and we just want to learn something from the word of God, uh, we kind of may ask ourselves, where is the need to you know, go into such depth about all of these things? But it matters, right? Uh, because um, if someone makes the allegation that, no, these letters that you know regarding as John's works are in fact written by some unknown person who never even knew Jesus and uh, was never even associated with the disciples, if they make an allegation like that, then uh, 
what we are holding on to as the truth you know comes under question so it is important for us as students of the bible uh, to know these things uh, to understand how with great care uh, the people in the past you know the people who were there in the uh, in the early times they took the effort to really analyze to look at the different writings of the different people uh, to see what they are saying about these epistles uh, and to you know compare and contrast and really find out whether whether this this was genuinely authored by someone who personally knew jesus or at least knew one of the disciples you know in a in a close manner and and would probably have been taught by them uh, so these things do matter for us um another thing that we see over here another similarity that we see um is the emphasis that is placed on jesus coming in the flesh and now that gets repeated a lot uh, you know in um, second john chapter 7 um it talks about deceivers i say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge jesus christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world uh in first john 42 a similar thing is expressed uh, where it says every spirit that acknowledges that jesus christ has come in the flesh is from god so um um these epistles were written because there were false teachings going around about uh, jesus and uh, john specifically writes these epistles uh, to put an end to all of these wrong deceptive teachings which are going around and therefore he says you know when he um, uh, starts writing first john chapter 1 uh, he in the beginning itself he says uh, that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked at and our hands have touched this we proclaim concerning the word of life you know so he says again in verse 3 again he repeats himself and he says we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard and so uh, he's urging the people in these letters in these epistles not to be um, deceived not to be led away uh, but uh, he says you know we are witnesses we have actually heard jesus speaking we have uh, we are putting down things which he has taught and so do not be led away by these uh, false teachers who are uh, you know teaching something wrong now um, <coughs> there are people who um, protested and said that they uh, you know that a different person had uh, had written these epistles simply because uh, they did not like the teachings which were given in revelation so because of that um, a lot of scholars they did not want to accept that john wrote the things which are written in the book of revelation and so they raised many many issues uh, they raised all kinds of arguments simply because for them it seemed very unacceptable that the man who wrote the gospel of john would also have written revelation because in a uh, revelation there was a lot of uh, debate going on about the millennium what exactly does the millennium uh, millennial period uh, you know talk about um, uh, uh, so all of those theories um, and the controversy surrounding those uh, went to such an extent where people were saying that no 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 uh you know the disciple of john would never have written these things so there must have been a different john and so a theory came up at that time saying that there were two johns one was john the elder because you know in second john and third john um the writer addresses himself as john the elder so they began to say there's somebody named john the elder who wrote these epistles on the other hand the gospel of john was not written by john the elder but by john the apostle and so they began to say that there are two johns one is the apostle and one is the elder however this is uh, not a very good um, you know explanation um, because uh, you know even uh, paul in some places he addresses himself as one of the elders okay so um, it's a term which the apostles used for themselves um they were apostles in their calling but they also addressed themselves as elders and uh, so we cannot say that um this person john the elder is a different man and that he is not you know the disciple of jesus um 
and moreover they say that you know john probably just simply referred to himself as john the elder because uh, he was very well known he had done a lot of years of ministry in ephesus in fact you know he even uh, dies over there his grave is also um, in ephesus itself um, i think it's irenius who says that that both uh, john and his disciple polycarp they were uh, you know they died and they were buried in ephesus so um, Ephesus was like the you know epicenter of a growing ministry. So John would go out from there to different places, uh, you know, doing follow up work, and then he would come back to the main center, which is Ephesus. And from there, he was you know functioning. He was doing his ministry. So he was very widely well known. And so he, in his letters, he just simply you know calls himself the elder because anyway they will know who he is. Uh, he doesn't need to give a, give an explanation about how he was a disciple of Jesus and all of that. Now, coming to the occasion, why was this book written? Um, like I said, uh, he explains to, uh, to us in John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 26, I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. So he talks about three categories of people who are leading uh, the church astray. The first, he calls them false prophets. Um, uh, that would be in uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, where he talks about uh, the false prophets. Now, um, the prophets are supposed to be people who are speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit. Okay, so if it is a true prophet, he would be speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, the false prophets would be speaking under the, in under the inspiration of another spirit, not the Holy Spirit but a fallen spirit so they would be false prophets in that sense which is why in um, you know first john chapter 4 he says um, you know uh, he calls the examining of the you know the teachings of the prophets he calls it the testing of the spirits he doesn't just say uh, you know an analysis of the prophets teachings rather he says testing of the spirits so why because uh, one set of teachings is coming down through a false spirit and the other set of teachings are coming down through the Holy Spirit. And um, so it's not just a matter of belief systems. It's not just a matter of opinions. It's literally needing to know whether what you are hearing and what you're being taught is coming out from the Holy Spirit directly, the source, you know, whether the source is the Holy Spirit or whether these teachings which are being taught to you are coming from another spirit. And it's very, very important for us to discern that. And so he says, test the spirits. Whenever something is being taught to you, immediately, you know, depend on the Lord and seek his guidance, uh, uh, which is why, uh, you know, discerning of the spirits is considered one of the giftings. So you need to be able to know uh, whether the things that are being taught come from the Holy Spirit or whether they're coming from an other spirit. So he talks about these false prophets who are speaking through a wrong false spirit. And the second uh, term that he uses for people who are leading the church astray uh, is the term deceivers. That's the term that is used in Second John uh, verse 7, where he says that uh, deceivers are, uh, you know, um, very cleverly using half truths uh, to make the people think that what is being said is the whole truth. And in that way, people are getting led astray. And the third term that he uses, he calls them antichrists. Uh, wherever he uses the word antichrist, he is talking about people who are uh, saying wrong things about the divinity and the humanity of Christ. Okay, so uh, we, uh, you know, from what we see in the Gospels, we uh, realize that Jesus was fully human and he was also fully God. But then these antichrists, um, they are uh, having, they're bringing wrong doctrines about Christ. So they'll either say that he was um, not fully human or they will say, no, no, he was not fully God. Uh, so wrong doctrines like that. Uh, were being brought in through the Antichrist, the ones who are against the actual correct teaching about Christ. Um, okay, there are two errors which are mainly dealt with. 
one is a theological error which the people uh, which the teachers the wrong teachers were bringing in and there was an ethical error okay the theological error was mainly regarding the incarnation of jesus christ so they were saying that jesus did not really come down in the flesh that was the main theological error that was being made and the ethical error that was being made um, was that um, humans are not really uh, you know i mean uh, believers believers are not really uh, sinful uh, because they have been forgiven by god and they have been brought into his family so you know in we uh, that doctrine exists even today people who say that believers cannot sin when we do something which goes against god's word it's it's a mistake that we have done but we are we can no longer sin whatever we do it is no longer a sin because we have been declared righteous righteous people cannot sin uh, you know so that was another wrong uh, doctrine that was coming in so um, the theological error was that they were denying the entire complete divinity and humanity of jesus the ethical error that the false teachers were bringing in is that no 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 it is not possible for believers to sin which is why right in first john 1 9 he says uh first john, first john 1 8 he says if you are saying that you never sin then you know you are being deceived uh so um so all of we we'll, of course you know we'll be looking at all of these things in greater detail uh even, even as we go through the letters and uh, the really interesting thing the important thing is that many of those false doctrines which were prevailing at that time they are prevailing in our churches even today uh, and it's very very risky very very dangerous so we need to know um, about these things and we will be studying them in detail we need to know our doctrines correctly so uh, so john takes the effort to write down these things so that uh, believers are not led astray um, when i was uh, doing my theological education uh, i this was many years ago uh, there was this person who had come and um, he was from a very reputed uh, college in the usa uh, so you know he had done a, where his detailed studies he knew his greek inside out and all of that and uh, he used to teach he used to say that uh, we don't we believers don't have to you know worry when we are doing something that goes against god's word because we are incapable of sin we whatever we are doing it is not sin in fact he went to the extent of saying that uh, if a person is addicted to something it's all right you know they just have to go on praying and saying lord you know you release me from my addiction and you go on continuing doing those things which you are doing uh, because one day when it is time god will just bring you out of it and a whole bunch of other stuff and he came under a lot of criticism and uh, i think two years after that they stopped inviting him to come and teach in that institution because he was creating a lot of havoc with his doctrines so um, you know we all of these things are prevailing even in the in, in the church even uh, today so um, it is so we are not looking at something which is outdated uh, we would be dealing when you know even as we go through these three epistles we would be dealing with issues uh, which are you know uh, rearing their head even today among us in in our current church so uh, let's just very briefly you know look at uh, three main wrong doctrines and the technical terms that are used for them and um, yeah let's see maybe we we don't need to go the entire uh, you know 50 minutes we'll see how much ever we can uh, you know look at and then we'll just close the first main thing was uh, docetism okay d o c e t i s m uh, docetism was basically this belief that even though jesus was you know moving around among people as a human being he wasn't actually completely human uh, he was still holding on to a lot of his divine um, you know characteristics and he continued to use those you know um, uh, he did not give up he did not surrender all of those uh, supernatural divine powers which he had he uh, so he was never fully completely human and uh, the 
argument that they used was that in the Old Testament, you know, whenever God appeared as the as the angel of the Lord, you know, in many many passages in the Old Testament, you have the angel of the Lord coming to the people, and he would look like a man, right? Um, because he would stand in front of them and then he would give them the message uh, of God, but uh, he was never fully human. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, even though he looked like a man, he was not fully human. So they say that Jesus was like that. He uh, looked human, but actually he was divine and he had held on to his divine uh, you know, privileges and powers, uh, which he did not give up. So um, John goes to great pains to try and you know, uh, establish the fact that Jesus was completely and totally human. Uh, and of course, there was even a divine side of him, which he had not lost, but he never used his divine privileges. He never used his divine powers. In fact, Jesus goes to the extent of saying that everything that I am doing, I only do it through the Father. Okay, so Gnosticism, you know, which you must have heard, um, was the other uh, wrong doctrine that was being spread. And uh, uh, that would be G N O S. T I C I S M, okay, Gnosticism. Uh, now, Gnosticism mainly the they they had two main teachings. One, they believe that all matter is impure, and second, it's knowledge which is pure and superior. So, anything to do with matter, uh, the flesh, it's all impure. On the other hand, uh, the the thought, knowledge, intellectualism. That is pure, is what they felt. Uh, so in their minds, the human body is something very evil. And uh, uh, so if God is good, and if God is the creator, he could not have created matter. He could not have created uh, hu the human body and uh, you know all of creation, because all of creation and, human, uh, and, and the human body are all evil and corrupt. And so they came up with this theory that God, being too pure and holy, could not have um, created, uh, you know, impure matter. And so God began to kind of evolve. He, there were a series of emanations so from the original or from the original created being. Okay, no, from the original creator and other sub creator emerged and then from that sub creator another sub creator emerged and uh, so somewhere down the line um, an impure form of the creator god he finally stooped down to the level where he created you know all of the trees and plants and animals and the human body and all of that why because god in his great purity cannot create something impure and the human body is impure animals are impure all of creation is impure um, so you see uh, this doctrine in a very subtle manner it was making people hate the beauty of god what of what god had done um, what god had declared you know as it is good you know, after each act of creation in the book of Genesis, you know, chapter one, after each act of creation, God looks upon it and he says, it is good. It is perfect. It is complete. And now this uh, doctrine is trying to uh, corrupt all of that. Yes, it is true that, you know, because of the sin of man, uh, the creation has come under a curse and uh, all of that is true. But the basic essence of what God made is indeed beautiful. And we can see that even now, I mean, in, in, even if you just simply look at the sunrise or the sunset, uh, you know, if you look at the beauty with which uh, the insects have been made, the detail with which he created each living being, there's great beauty in all of that. But the Gnostics uh, were blinded to such an extent where they looked down upon creation, where they looked down upon everything of beauty that God had made and so they went to the extent of saying that god could not have created matter because matter is something evil it is something very low and so for them accepting what uh, the bible is saying became very difficult because it says that god himself became man 
and put on a human body. He came down in the flesh. So for them, it was impossible to understand how can someone so holy put on something so unholy and corrupt and evil as the human body. Now, the point is, the human body in itself is not evil, right? It is the inclinations, the sinful nature which came down from generation to, uh, no, generation, to generation because of Adam. That is evil. But if you just simply take the human vessel, the human, you know, the, 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 the flesh as such, that itself is not evil. And Jesus, when he came down um, and took on human flesh, he was just taking the human form. He was not taking on the human inclinations which had come down from Adam. Uh, so because, you know, he was born through the virgin birth. So uh, for them, for the Gnostics, it was difficult for them to understand how God could have taken on fleshly form because in their eyes, uh, the flesh was something evil. And they also had a big problem with accepting the fact that uh, the church, um, the, you know, the, the church is considered the uh, temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, how can human body, human beings with human bodies, you know, contain the Holy Spirit in them? Because in their mind, uh, the human flesh is something corrupt. And uh, so they came very strongly against the entire doctrine, the very basic foundational doctrine, which you know the Bible teaches. And they began to criticize all of it. And they said, you know, uh, um, if you really want to be saved, you need to have access to knowledge, a superior knowledge which God reveals to certain people, you know, whom He will set free from their physical bodies. And only such people have salvation because God will reveal his secret hidden knowledge to them. And then they will be set free from their human body and they will be saved. It all sounds rather far-fetched to us. Uh, but for the people in the early church, um, uh, it seemed like a very fancy doctrine because a lot of people began to follow that, you know, because they were they would have these... Uh, uh, fancy meetings you know which where only the select few are invited and they would have secret discussions about all this special knowledge uh, and uh, everyone wanted to you know be invited to one of these so that they too can know this hidden knowledge and find out um, you know get to know god in an intimate way and and all of that so for them it was like a very uh, popular fancy theory that was going around and uh, the church, uh, the believers wanted to be a part of that. And uh, so um, John had to take very strong steps, you know, and talk about it and say, you know, um, there is no such thing as a hidden knowledge. And um, there are scriptures where he, in fact, says, you know, what God has revealed, he has revealed it to all. Um, I've written it down somewhere. Yeah, you, you have it in uh, First John chapter 2. 2 verses 13 to 14, uh, again verse 20, and then in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, you know, where he says, All of us know, you know, all of us have received the same message, we all of us have received the same anointing. Um, and from the beginning, you know, you have heard uh, what has been taught, and he, you know, says all of these things because he's counteracting this wrong teaching that there is some kind of hidden special knowledge which god gives only to a few so john is saying no no it's not that way um god has revealed his truth to all and we all know it we have all received the same anointing and the same message okay so he says these things to counteract the uh, wrong teaching which these people were trying to bring in there was a third thing um which was started by serenthus okay some person named serenthus it was known as serenth Serenthism or something like that. Okay, um, so um, this person now, what was his teaching? <laughs> he said that Jesus was born as a normal human being. Uh, in fact, he was born to Joseph and Mary. Okay, so uh, the the physical normal human baby that was born to this couple, Joseph and Mary, that was Jesus. Uh, but even as Jesus went about his, uh, you know, childhood, he was a very, very godly person. 
and so therefore one day when he, when he was getting baptized then christ came down you know christ as in god god the son christ came down and uh, took hold of him so he came down in the form of a dove and that is when jesus um, became divine in the sense now the you now christ was living inside him and then at the time of crucifixion uh, christ leaves him the the spirit of christ goes away from him and now jesus just does the suffering on his own on the cross and uh, you know he dies and then later when the resurrection has to happen the the, the christ again comes into him and therefore he is able to arise now do you look at this you know subtlety of this teaching uh, on the cross when that work of crucifixion is going on according to this doctrine um, the spirit of christ is no longer there in this in this human jesus and so all that was done on the cross is like worthless useless you know look at the tactics that satan came up with during the time of the early church you know to cut right at the very base of of the fundamental doctrines on which you know we stand and so it was very very vital that john and the other apostles and the other writers of the bible come very strongly against these teachings and clarify to the people what is the truth okay so uh, this was uh, this person serenthus and um, there's this story which i think it was Irenaeus who writes you know in his uh, in one of his books uh, he writes that uh, one day uh, john um, you know the apostle john disciple of john uh, disciple of jesus uh, had gone to the bath house in ephesus you know right i mean um, they didn't have their own private bathrooms in their homes uh, you know they had this bath house so if you want a bath you would go over there and then you know you would um, uh, you know uh, sit there in those waters so um, uh john the uh, john the disciple of jesus goes over there to the bath house one day and he sees serenthus over there and uh, he's supposed to have you know not even uh, taken his bath he just came out immediately and he said may the bath house may the, may the roof of the bath house fall down because uh, serenthus the enemy of the truth is inside or something like that so uh, irenus records this in his writings i mean i don't know whether whether it's true or whether it is not true but the point is um serenthus was someone who was very much alive and you know um going around preaching his wrong teachings during the time of john uh, and john had to deal with these issues he had to protect the people of god from these uh, wrong teachings okay so um these are just some of the main uh, things that i wanted to you know touch upon uh, so next class onwards uh, we would go into detail uh, uh, and uh, look uh, you know verse by verse um what john has to say as a word of warning and as clarification to the believers of the early church regarding important matters of doctrine all right so uh, anyone who has any questions that you want to raise yes please go ahead yes J just a clarity ma it, it seems like john the apostle was kind of the last man standing out of the 12 from from our discussions on this introduction yeah he writes at a, a later time so you have the first three gospels being written off you know very early um they say within maybe around uh you know mark Ma, the, the gospel of mark especially was written maybe just about 40 or 50 years after the death of uh, death and resurrection of jesus christ so it was as early as that on the other hand um john writes much later in fact they say that during the time of uh, lifetime of john itself peter gets martyred you know uh, is what they say um that during the final years of nero uh, you know before his death he gets uh, he's the one who crucifies uh, peter so while john was still alive uh, peter gets martyred so yes it was a it was a late it was a, at a later date uh, probably probably because john was maybe a younger person than the rest of the other disciples so yes thank you uh, yes a anything uh, else all right we'll, uh, we'll we'll close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for uh, the things that we could learn today 
Uh, we looked at the last chapter of um, John. And Lord, we thank you for uh, the lesson that you have, have imparted to us through the conversation that you had with Peter. You're not a God who wants to condemn us. You're not a God who wants to go on uh, holding a grudge against us regarding the ways that we have you know, fallen and been disloyal to you. But Lord, you're a God who forgives, who forgets, and who only wants to lift us up and build us up. And so thank you, O oh Lord, that in you we have hope. Thank you, Lord, that in you uh, there is hope that you will purify us and cleanse us from our unrighteousness and you will cause us to rise above. And when the next time we are tempted in the same area, we will be victorious in and through you. Thank you for the deep assurance that we have, O oh Lord, of victory in and through you. Also, Lord, we thank you for these uh, epistles of John, which uh, were, were written out in those days. Thank you, O oh Lord, for all the uh, truths and the clarifications that you have placed in these pages so that Lord even today uh, when we are faced with all kinds of uh, uh, half truths and wrong doctrines we will be able to stand up and speak out against those so Lord from next class even as we go through the epistles you open up the scriptures to us a lot and you help us a lot to catch the truths which you are uh, which you have placed over there so that we can boldly uh, you know uh, defend the truth and speak out when wrong doctrines uh, come to our churches and our people. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, now, this session was rather, you know, more of a um, dull introduction and theory, but, uh, you know, all of you have been very patient in listening. So thank you so much. And we'll meet again next week. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Thank Pastor. You. God bless you.